It's Christina. Really excited to be here and thank you everyone who's who's attending live and thank you if you catch it after the fact too. It really means a lot to us, Martha and I. So a little bit about who we are today. So I'm Robbie Lockman. I'm the lead evangelist at Harness. I quote unquote marry people in technology. And so Martha, maybe a little bit about yourself before we get started. Absolutely. I'm one of the product managers here at Harness and uh, I'm responsible for the continuous delivery aspect that we do in Harness. So looking forward to talking to all of you. Thanks, Samarth. And so what are we going to be talking about today? So if the title didn't give it away, we'll be talking a little bit about GetOps or a lot about GetOps, but we're going to start talking about the rise of infrastructure as code. So IAC, right? So kind of the precursor to GetOps, like how do we get to infrastructure as code and what is what were some challenges to infrastructure as code? Uh, and then hello, GetOps for your application infrastructure. Uh, and then talking about the pillars of GetOps. So there's a really good piece by Weaveworks who's one of the, the godfathers of GetOps. And they actually have four pillars that they have that is a stringent definition of GetOps. And so you know, your mileage might vary depending if you agree or disagree with them, but when looking to implement GetOps, uh, they're usually a good idea to kind of follow some of those pillars. And then also supercharging your GetOps journey. It's like, hey, how do you get started? What are the tool, tooling landscape looks like? And also, again, some of the pitfalls out there to watch out for. So the rise of infrastructure as code. So we're gonna do a little bit of role play here today. So my buddy Samarth will have several jobs today, uh, but he's, trust me, Samarth is the same person over and over. So let's, let's go back to a decade ago, right? And so my, my background is actually in application development. So I've been writing Java for over a decade and see, see the evolution and revolution that occurred. But if we take it back about 10 years ago, you know, it's everything was what we needed was kind of statically provisioned, right? So my dev environment might be my local machine. If there's any sort of dev piece of infrastructure, it might be going in a VM, right? So I need a build server, not maybe Jenkins on a VM. I need an application server <laughs> as a separate VM. I might have an artifact repository. Nah, so this, guess, guess what? That's a separate VM. Uh, but as we kind of transverse uh, the journey to production, um, these other environments had to be pre-provisioned, right? Again, there's, there were, you know, there might've been some automation in the VM level, but the environments again were pre-provisioned. So Samarth is the quintessential system engineer. Hey, Samarth, I need another node at JBoss. Let me get you another VM, Ravi. Samarth, you know, I need, <laughs> I need uh, to make a, another node of a load balancer or a web server. He's like, okay, here's some HTTPD. And then even well, pretending this, this load balancer person is not some mark like, oh, I need a role ba load balancing change. Well, that I have to go talk to the networking engineer for that, right? But they were statically uh, provisioned. So how long did this take, right? And so these, these wait times are wait times that I experienced in more than one employer. <clears throat> so like if, if I need to get a new virtual machine, it could be a couple of weeks. No, I don't know why the networking team had such a long lead time over and over that the guards of our corporate network uh, but it could take, you know, months sometimes, right? And then making a new app server node a little bit quicker, you know, talking to the middleware engineer, uh, they're a little bit more snappy and like getting me the additional JBoss node, but this is typically the lead time uh, that it would take. And who would do this? Uh, potentially it could be three separate people, right? So here as I am as a developer or development manager, having to orchestrate uh, multiple tickets, multiple systems, like, hey, Samarth, give me a VM. Uh, networking Samarth. Can, can we get you know, make a, a load balancing change and then middleware engineer Samarth, can you please give me another node of JBoss? And, and so it, it typically was three separate people, ironically here, it all names Samarth, but uh, it, it typically took three sets of people, right? And so and lead, so it, with, with these long lead times, um, it, it, it costs money, right? Like, why are you sitting around waiting for a month? Why can't you, you know, get your idea into production? This is an actual script that I wrote. Now, I, I did... Uh, you know, kind of change the name of the script. But um, when I used to work for an investment bank, uh, you know, I, I had several VMs out there running different nodes of Webster application server. Uh, and basically the uh, the infrastructure team would say, if it's not being used, they want to turn it off. But, you know, turning it on was really hard. And so I would touch on the hour every hour <laughs> with the different nodes, right? So to kind of get around that. But hey, you know, it, it's innovation necessity leads to innovation and this was what I had to do to keep my VMs on. Uh, but now, um, kind of fast forward a couple years after that, th there's a rise in infrastructure as code, right? And so instead of having things static provisioned or manually provisioned, uh, the rise of these particular tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, uh, pick your tooling of choice. There's lots of IAC tools out there and platforms out there now. 
Um, it really gave rise to us to be able to do a couple of things uh, fairly, fairly quickly or more repeatable. And so what are the benefits? I know this is on the ISC talk, but what are the benefits of having infrastructure as code, right? Well, th th these are the, the three really big benefits. Um, the first thing was repeatable, right? Like we strive for things being repeatable as engineers. Uh, so if something is repeatable, it's also consistent, right? So I can call this like new, let's say, uh, VM provisioning uh, ISC or new, like, let's say, EC2 instance provisioning uh, uh, infrastructure as code, and it, you can call it over and over again. And this also helps with um, items being, you know what, I, ha I have a great deal of confidence uh, in my infrastructure. And But the big thing here uh, it is also callable, right? And so you can call infrastructure's code in other parts of the process. So for example, if you have a continuous integration or continuous delivery pipeline, uh, the big change the last couple of years were uh, these pipelines becoming infrastructure aware, a little bit off topic uh, right now, but that was also a really big deal, right? Like, hey, these ISCs are able to integrate in other processes. If infrastructure is available, uh, those those times really, really came down, right? And so it, potentially if infrastructure is available, you, know, you can get a brand new VM in 10 minutes. Uh, you can make a load balancer change in minutes. Uh, you can get a new wired in application server to, you know, using JBoss into the domain controller uh, in like five minutes, right? Like if infrastructure is available, uh, you seem to get it fairly quickly, right? And so that, that's kind of the, the, the Nirvana state. But there are certain things that IAC lacks or it's extremely challenging to orchestrate infrastructure as code. And so let's spend a minute actually going through this. So what is missing in infrastructure as code? So going back to personification, uh, I'm going to be the application developer, right? And so again, so Martha is a system engineer again. Uh, I have, an, so as a developer, I have a reasonable expectation that if a node goes down, it should come back, right? I, I don't care what system it's on. If there's something goes down, it should come back. Uh, and also, um, you know, in, in locked in my head, I, I have the order of operations that we need, right? So I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we have a distributed application that has like a Redis database, has a cache, an in-memory cache. So clearly, you know, we need to, the cache needs to be there and like lukewarm before the application joins it. Like I have all of this knowledge, right? But how do I translate that over to the system engineer or the cloud infrastructure engineer? Um, it gets actually fairly complicated, right? Like, hey, specifically giving order operations or what I would deem as, it's, it's the straddles the border of like application infrastructure and infrastructure operations. Um, you know, Samarth has now a lot more tools that he has to use, right? Not only is, let's say our infrastructure as code stack as Puppet, but you need to monitor, you know, you need to create other infrastructure or monitor for nodes going down. So you're using tools like satellite and cloud forms. Even making something, the harder part is making it application aware. Like, oh, you know, if we, if the application is having bad performance, we should scale or certain scaling events. Then you're using like another tool. Like, for example, if we're sticking to the Red Hat stack here, it would be something like JBoss Operations Network, uh, getting very granular um, metrics and very getting granular operational tasks based on those metrics. And, and this is where it gets complicated, right? Like this is who has the knowledge how to do this who, who, or who doesn't have the knowledge to do this. And this is where GetOps actually comes in, right? And so uh, GetOps is actually a way of bridging the gap between those two and also providing it uh, as code. So let's get into a little bit of the history of GetOps and you know what, what are some of the benefits. So the mighty Kubernetes, right? And so uh, kind of a, a precursor to a lot of the Get, GetOps mantra is, is having a declarative system, in this case, or declarative state system, which is the number one most prevalent one out there that, uh, that folks know is Kubernetes. And going back to that argument that, hey, you know what, if, if a, for example, if a node dies or a, a particular part of the application service dies, it should come back up. Well, this is exactly what this container orchestrator Kubernetes does, right? I can declare like minimums, right? Like, hey, in this case, it's kind of watered down. Like, hey, I only have one replica, but let's say I had two. Uh, the scheduler inside the orchestrator will take care of that, right? And so there's a lot of that locked in application knowledge. It's being uh, actually visible in a YAML, right? So you, you can do things, all sorts of things in Kubernetes. Order of operations, sure, you can run an operator <laughs> or have a custom controller or custom resource. Uh, a lot of that application infrastructure knowledge is now could be authored uh, by being the developer, right? Like, hey, this is what my expectation is, and this is I can hand it off. Uh, also, with Kubernetes, there is there's code where there's has not been code before, <laughs> right? So, 
Uh, for example, let's say our load balancing stack was FI based, right? Uh, now, not necessarily, we, we might not be locked into a hardware vendor, right? For, for those particular routing changes, we might be using a service mesh like Istio, right? So uh, <laughs> again, we can codify those particular changes uh, into a Kubernetes manifest, uh, aka a YAML. And today, if you take a look at what is actually going on, right? So the modern purveyors of platforms, uh, the amount of time it takes to deploy something in Kubernetes is super quick, right? Like if, if now given if your cluster has capacity, <clears throat> I can make a route change in seconds, right? Or I can spin up a volume with stuff uh, in seconds. And so this really shows that there's no more lead time. And this leads us to, again, <laughs> what, what happens to Marth? You know, does Samarth still have a job here at our company, right? Like, <laughs> which kind of leads us to like the changing of the roles, right? And so this, this actually, it, it's, it's kind of the good and bad about GetOps, right? Shifting a lot of this expertise towards the development team is that now there's this modern notion of what I like to call a full lifecycle developer. It's uh, if you write the service, you run it, right? Or if you, if you uh, op, if it's build or, you run what you write or you operate what you build, right? And so not only as an engineer or software engineer that I wrote the feature, I need to be able to give a very viable option of how it's supposed to run, which leads to you know, the changing role of system engineer. Like if we're actually, we are extremely invested here at Harness uh, in, in Kubernetes. And so uh, we have a platform engineering team, right? They're the purveyors of our Kubernetes platforms or the public cloud offerings of, of those platforms. And basically it goes from, uh, you know, instead of a system engineer writing bespoke code or writing bespoke infrastructure as code, it's the platform engineers is making sure there's capacity. So when a customer, an internal customer like myself needs some sort of service deployed, um, they have tooling to onboard and offboard that. Which leads us to the first part. <laughs> so software engineer, remember, uh, the first part is, it is as, as uh, obvious as this is, the first part of GetOps is actually Get or Get. So, for those of you who don't know what GET is, GET uh, was invented by Linus Torvald himself, uh, Mr. Linux, uh, that it's a source code management platform, right? And so uh, as a software engineer, I I'm used to writing code. I'm used to committing code. Uh, source code management is, it supports iteration, right? So I'm used to versioning things. I'm used to like, hey, this is the particular state you know, of my application uh, that I need. And what what is you know bringing in source code management into to kind of the infrastructure side is... Well, there's a couple of concepts that source code management has, right? So the first thing is uh, versioning, right? And so, you know, depending on, uh, you know, if you're able to version your scripts or version some of the provisioning stuff, depending where you are, some people are like, oh, you know, we've been doing this for a while. But if, if it's kind of a new concept to you, uh, instead of underlining something like, oh, this is, you know, my provisioner underscore final underscore final final, right? I used to do that <laughs> before version control on the SH, right? Like you have the ability to kind of segregate uh, the point in time what the infrastructure should be. And also what's very important about uh, using sort of an SCM is uh, diff management, right? Or differences management. So if uh, what ends up happening is that more than one person is going to be working on, on a piece of code. As a software engineer, that's, that's a given. Maybe as an infrastructure engineer, you know, you might be the sole author of the uh, infrastructure's code or, but as, as, as that, that lineage or knowledge kind of pushes left, right? You, it's one of the fallacies of distributed systems. You know, there's, there's only one admin, no, there's not. <laughs> you know, there's multiple admins for, for things. And so how, having you be more collaborative, right? And what, you know, my, my big push is that software is iterative, right? And so as a software engineer, um, I'm used to not getting something right the first time. I've never gotten something right the first time. And which could be a little bit different uh, if you're an infrastructure engineer, right? Like, you know, there's no, you know, minus having a sandbox, uh, you're always dealing in production. You always have to get something right, right? Like coming from my side of the equation, I never got anything right the first time. And so software is iteration, software is trial and error, right? And so it, it's as a software engineer, and this is gonna get into what GitOps is in a sec, uh, is if I make a commit, uh, that means I'm ready for the world to see something, right? Now it might not be correct, but a lot of what agile preaches or very iterative design preaches is that you're incrementally building stuff, right? And so with getting that big bang or boil the ocean uh, might be a little more difficult. And so let's go to the formal definition uh, of what GitOps is. And so uh, GitOps, it, it's, it's a term coined, a lot of words on the screen that kind of boil it down, but basically it's what GitOps is, if it's a term that came out in 2017. And a, a, the sole goal of GetOps is that it should be as easy as an engineer committing code 
uh, for example, like we do that all the time, telling the world our, ch our change is ready um, to basically enact all of the infrastructure and application changes that's needed to occur, right? And so uh, this might be executing tests as, as confidence building. This might be making sure that, you know, there's a some sort of rolling deployment going on or some deployment going on. This might be even provisioning more infrastructure, right? And also, um, if there's any sort of variance in that, how do you rectify that? And so this gets into the uh, four pillars uh, of, of uh, GitOps, right? And so uh, I'll kind of get into what these particular four, four pillars are um, in, in, in kind of in detail. So the first one is uh, everything should be, uh, this, the underlying system should be declarative, right? And so what, what that means, if something is declarative, um, it's like me, how was it to think of Samarth again? Samarth, I would like a pepperoni pizza and Samarth will deliver me a pepperoni pizza. Now he's also a pizza delivery man in this example. So uh, I didn't have to say Samarth, I need cheese that is you know 2% fat. I need a pepperoni that is honestly and craftily and fair use sourced. You know, uh, it, It's basically the describing what you want, a pepperoni pizza, and you're getting a pepperoni pizza, right? For that two pizza team, that fictitious two pizza team. Uh, now, the, the rationale behind why something has to be declared of, uh, is that because, again, you're using um, using uh, a lot of what it blows into the second pillar, right? Like, hey, you're declaring a state. I need three instances of my application. I need to have ports exposed here, here, and here. I need metrics to be speed out here, here, and here. And at any given time, you know, this is what I need for version one of my application. Because that recipe, uh, the source of truth should be in get, right? Or in, in source code. So at... at if the, if the uh, version of truth is in, in, in uh, source code, and more people can see it, right? Hey, you, a lot of people can have access to what that recipe is, uh, which boils into point three and point four, which are a little bit more like prescriptive, right? So if there's any variance, uh, let's say uh, the declare, so what a declarative state system is really good at is immediately fulfilling your request. Like, hey, I need three, three replicas. So it will drop the hammer and try to fulfill that request as quickly as possible. If let's say that I went into Kubernetes and made a direct change uh, to that, say, oh, up the, you know, go kubectl apply, like, or kubectl increase replica up to four, um, the, the version control system and the, the quote unquote get ops, if, it, if we were supporting a full get ops model, will say, oh, no, 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 uh, th there's a variance in the state, right? So that, what that means is that whatever is in source control uh, is the absolute truth, right? So if you were to say, uh, this is, boils into the concept of auto healing and or uh, or um, <clears throat> uh, re reconciliation, right? And so again, everything that can get is the, tr is the truth. And also, again, like wh when when leveraging GetOps, uh, you're actually codifying all the steps. So going back to, hey, I need you know the the Redis node to come up, or I need the, the in memory node to come up before the application node. Uh, I need to test, you know, execute this amount of code coverage or test coverage all of these steps are codified at this point, right? And so there, there's no loss in translation between the author and the runner of the of said, um, of said infrastructure. Uh, one of the, uh, also one of the other pillars uh, that I brought up was just in, enforcement or auto healing, right? This is actually f fairly big that uh, the quote unquote, this is uh, what would be called drift detection, right? So as an infrastructure engineer, one of the things that you, know, you, you, you strive for is configuration control. Right, so oh, you know what? We don't want random people going in and adding additional environmental variables or adding things to Bash C or what, or you know, the list can go on for like what you want to control the environment. Uh, if using a GitOps operator, uh, which I will pass over to Mark in a little bit to explain what those more moving pieces pieces are, is that yeah, hey, you're able to you know reconcile very quickly. The system will enforce that there was change uh, in the descriptive state. Uh, but with that, I will hand it over to my buddy. And we can just talk about what are some of the tooling looks like. If you were curious about hey, how, do, how do I enable this in my organization, we'll give you a little bit of a prescription here. Samarth. Thank you, Ravi. So speaking of you know, the right tools for the job, there are countless tools that are you know, gonna help you integrate the whole GitOps approach that Ravi was talking about. You, know, you can add these different tools as a part of your workflow. Um, some of the common GitOps tools that we are seeing are you know, Argo, this Flux, this Jenkins X. So with all these different tools, you know, when you get started, you have this whole concept of Git being your source of truth and how exactly you can have different YAML files that you could change. And, you know, that could propagate those changes across different environments. 
We have the two deployment models. One is the push-based and the other is the pull-based deployment models. I do want to spend some time on the push versus pull-based. Um, if you look on the left side, the push-based, right, what happens is that your image registry will become the source of truth. This is more on the lines of the DevOps flow that we see. So what we are saying is that whenever a new image comes in, then your workflow pulls or pushes that particular image as a part of the deployment, and then you know a workflow gets triggered. On the other hand, when you see the pull-based deployments, this is exactly where the GitOps module comes into play, right? You have an operator that sits in between your image registry and environment repository. It's taking a look at the newer set of Git commits that happen. And as soon as the state in Git changes, it's pulling the newly configured uh, Git change and that you know, makes Git the source of truth. So what you're basically seeing over here is that your image registry and your environment repository will always remain in sync. So say Ravi decides to go and make a change on the cluster tomorrow morning, you know, I will be able to see that because Git will remain the source of truth. Same thing if I go and revert a particular change, right? Ravi will go and see the same change. So irrespective of who makes the change, Git will always remain the source of truth. Just like everything else, GitOps is good at some things and these tools are you know, bad at some things. GitOps tools are great at number one, monitoring for changes or drift. So as I mentioned, if you know you wanted to go ahead and deploy a security fix, right? And this is something that you wanna make sure that this is being applied to the correct environment. That's where drift detection comes into play. We see what exactly is the change. We can see the commit ID, the person who's gonna make that commit, you know, the hash that's associated with it. And then that's basically giving us that, hey, this is exactly what is getting changed on this environment, which is being deployed to this particular cluster. The other thing is reconciliation. As Ravi touched upon this before, it's really important that you know, GitOps really helps with the whole reconciliation part. Uh, it makes sure that your cluster, as well as you know, your image registry, always remain in sync. Last not least is the source code management and Git integration. This helps keeping you know, the role-based access control in check. It also makes sure that the right people have the right permissions, but also because Git is gonna remain your source of truth, we know which set of deployments are happening and you know, in which particular environment. So that's always gonna be there. Just like everything else, GitOps tools is, are bad at some things too. Well, when it comes to a non-declarative infrastructure, uh, at that point, GitOps you know, does not really do a good job because GitOps is mostly designed on the declarative side. And the reason I even say this is because you know, if you're not using uh, GitOps in this case, because you know, once the non-declarative part comes into play, are you even doing GitOps? I think that's you know, the bigger question, right? Because you start disqualifying Git at that period of time. Um, the way I see it is that from a non-Kubernetes deployment standard, when you're doing an EC2-based deployment, right? In that case, it does not really reconcile when something breaks on the VM. So you know, when it comes to that, GitOps is not really good at handling those situations. Next is failures, audit trails, and RBAC. The important thing is that GitOps does not really give you the entire audit trail information. If you have an approval gate in the middle, if you have a role-based access control in the middle, it can't really give you the entire flow from the start to the end in a particular workflow or a pipeline in which stage who has done what, when, and where. So that is you know, something that GitOps is not gonna be helpful. It will give you the hash ID, it'll give you the commit ID, but it does not give you the end-to-end -end flow. Last not least is the confidence building steps. Now think about you know, probably an enterprise grade uh, customer or even a financial institution who has all these different steps in between, which could be their load tests, could be performance tests, it could be other forms of tests that they run as they promote an artifact or their YAML file from one environment to another. When GitOps comes into the picture with confidence building steps, it does not really do a good job. The reason is because GitOps is all about being instant. With a performance test, with a load test, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna make sure that the API you know, is returning a particular value. It is making sure that we get a particular message. We have a payload that's returning something. When it comes to that, you know, GitOps is not the best way to go. All right, supercharging GitOps. One of the big questions that you know, we usually listen to is, is GitOps only for Kubernetes? And the answer to this question is that, you know, GitOps is not only about Kubernetes. Um, if, you're, if any system can be handled and managed declaratively and it has convergence at some point, then you know, GitOps is good for that. Uh, take your ECS containers. You know, we can absolutely do GitOps for ECS as well. It just depends how your containers have been designed and you know, if they can converge at some time and they can be declarative, then absolutely GitOps is the way to go for that. Next is GitOps for immediacy and uh, failure situations. 
when it comes to handling failure situations, GitOps, you know, do a pretty good job. But again, it goes back to a point where you have to basically tell us which particular version of your YAML files need to be reapplied. So it has to be instantaneous. Again, if you have multiple flows that happen as a part of your workflow, then GitOps is not the way to go. Centralized strategy. Um, when it comes to centralized strategy, Git will remain the source of truth, which basically means that any changes that happen will be registered in Git. And that makes it really convenient because anybody who's monitoring from an infrastructure perspective or you know, from an engineering management perspective, they know what exactly is being deployed and where it is being deployed. And last but not least, DevOps versus GitOps. I do wanna spend about a minute or two, just walk through the different uh, the differences between DevOps and GitOps, because I feel like you know this is a place where it really kind of gets confusing. So DevOps is is nothing but you know the whole uh, silo to break between development and operation. And DevOps is a push-based model, as we discussed a few slides ago. The other thing is it does follow a declarative approach, but the issue with DevOps is that you need to monitor each and every layer and each and every approach that you take as a part of your deployment pipeline. Now, the automation of the dev and operation, the operations that happen, you have to bind everything together. You can't really have a single step doing all of it. In the case of GitOps, when we switch gears to GitOps, right, it is more intelligent because it is automated operations. Uh, whenever there is a drift that we detect, it automatically goes ahead, it pulls that particular configuration. You have an operator that's pulling that particular configuration, the latest set of changes, and then it's applying those changes to the different clusters, right? So GitOps basically powers the continuous delivery cycle, introducing the pull-based model. Now, GitOps is having you know, declarative uh, infrastructure as code, as Ravi mentioned. So what you could do possibly is you could have your entire application get deployed, but you could also have your infrastructure that is being provisioned before that step coming in through GitOps. And you know, that also helps keeping the cost in check. Last not least is you know, it monitors the state or your desired and your current state of the cluster. What's really important is that when you are specifically deploying something, you need to make sure that your cluster remains in sync with the images that are being deployed. In that case, you, know, you can get the latest and greatest into the hands of your end users as soon as possible it is getting developed. So GitOps really helps to monitor that state you know, and it also helps to keep those uh, different YAMLs in check across different environments. And then, you know, it, it obviously binds the whole monitoring and deployment, and it does not redo really anything with development and operations, because Git is all about making sure that, you know, we can deploy as soon as possible, but also monitor as we deploy. And should something break, it provides the flexibility to roll back as soon as possible, just like Harness does. Cool. Well, I, I think that that was uh, very, very insightful. Thank you for that, Samar. And I, I think this, this this portion ends our, at least we're preaching to you as part of the conversation, right? So love to answer the questions. I see there's a couple of questions in there. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more, you know, we, we have a whole bunch of GitOps material. If you have the quick, give a quick scan uh, or head to that URL at Bitly, uh, you can definitely learn more. And so let's, let's go through some of these uh, particular questions that keep them coming. Uh, so the first question was, um, do you think GitOps is good for small companies and projects? So you can take it, I can take it. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> so GitOps is good for small companies for sure. Uh, reason being, you know, because uh, smaller companies go on to deploy features and test so often, right? Uh, you always wanna make sure that you are deploying often, but you have some form of control as you deploy it. You can run some tests across it. And you know you wanna make sure that if this is a project you wanna test with or probably you know, do a canary deployment, you wanna test it with a smaller set of people, then GitOps is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Like, especially if you're starting, uh, you know, starting a, a net new project, right? Like it, it, you know, when you're picking up the infrastructure, you might be looking to a modern, modern piece of infrastructure, like a container orchestrator. It just enforces good, good habits, uh, right? So I don't think it's, you know, it, there's, there's any patterns like in any particular paradigm. GitOps is a, is a paradigm, right? It is a little tooling heavy uh, based on like where it came from. Um, and you know their their opinions that were the, the several projects that kind of kick it off. But hey, I, I feel that it's good. Uh, I want to take the next the first stab at the next question. I have a very strong opinion on this one. So, um, is so this next question was is it is GitOps only applicable uh, with Git or can other you know, version control systems use that too? So this gets into like 
it, it's it's like it's like anything in technology right like how stringent of a definition do you want to keep it to like, like for example microservices you know it, it's it's a design pattern per se but if you take a look at like the quintessential microservice manifesto it's like oh you know what you have to have different copies of the data it needs to be you know, message based it should no, you should have guaranteed communication like between you know the the services and it's like how many of us are doing that right like 15 years ago or yeah 15 now years ago i remember one of my first projects at a university uh you know, we were using clearcase right as our source control system and we had the ability to you know every time someone on the team would commit we would kick off a build in buildforge right and so uh it, it, certain things make sense, right? Like, hey, and my, my favorite part of GetOps was the SCM event, right? Like, oh, even some version publishes events, get publishes events, right? Like, you, you can take you, you can take the pillars and up to a point, right? Like, hey, if the main thing is, you know, we're using pre, preforce or using subversion or CVS, uh, all of those things publish events, right? So you might be able to automate the build or automate a piece of it. Uh, and then, you know, again, not having to, this gets into like, if your infrastructure is not declarative, um, you can you can take the pillars of it, right? Minus the enforcement stuff might be a little bit difficult. Uh, let's see here. So uh, thanks for that question. So the next question uh, we'll give to Samarth. Yeah, sure. Is that, is that, so uh, for, for GetOps, um, should you have all the Kubernetes manifest in a single repo or can you have it in multiple repos? So, so we've seen different organizations, uh, you know, handle this differently. Uh, the whole concept of monorepo is something we've seen is common across the board, but I believe personally, based on you know the different uh, articles I've read and the research we've done, it seems like it is important to have this set up in multiple repos. And the reason being that you know you might want to have some role-based access control around it, right? You want to make sure that only the right sort of people have access to the right manifests. And when they're applying those manifests, right, we want to make sure it's only being applied to certain environment types. So it's okay to keep it, you know, specifically in multiple repos. But that is, you know, keeping um, in mind that, you know, we want some role-based access control around it. And the only time I would say that, you know, we have to keep the Kubernetes manifest in a single repository is when you know that, you know, this is going to be applied commonly across all services. If, you know, you have certain manifests that are being commonly applied across, maybe, you know, it's a security manifest that you want to apply across all services, maybe login, log out, then yeah, absolutely. That could be in a single repo. For everything else, I believe it's the best to have it, you know, across multiple repos. Gets into the uh, the the religious debate: mono repo versus multi repo. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and also it gets into like system design, right? Like so, like I, I see side both. I see both sides of it. Um, it it's I, I favor the multiple repo portion of it because, like, when, when you're dealing with like Kubernetes specifically, it's like what is actually what what is a Kubernetes ma manifest? It's you're actually it's you're telling Kubernetes to change, right? You're you're enacting some sort of change in the system. And that change is declarative, right? Like you, you're giving a desired state, but usually that desired state, when you have another manifest, is different than the previous state, right? And so it all it all goes down to, you know, do you want to do this? Is as cliche as it sounds? Are you making one big whiz bang change, or are you making very small changes? Uh, you know, it, it's similar to having, you know, a fifteen thousand line shell scripts, right? Like, you know, it, does it make sense to have more compartment lines? Kubernetes manifest, yes, in my opinion. It makes it more makes sense friendly, but you know, to each to each their own. Um, so, good question. So, uh, next question: um, Are there any organization or team structures that work better with GetOps? So, always like a hand to you first, Samarth, and then come with my opinion. Absolutely. Uh, with regards to this, what I believe works the best is you know when it comes to smaller team structures. For sure, then you know GitOps is a good play, one hundred percent. But when you have this whole disparity between who's handling the provisioning of the infrastructure and who's handling the actual application deployment, earlier it would be the SRE team that we would coin, and we would say, "Hey, the SRE team is responsible for doing this." But uh, to be honest with you, uh, you know the team structure that really works the best is you have your, you know, the, the slide that Ravi really pulled up, the platform engineer. They're responsible for handling your application code, but they also know what is the infrastructure that needs to be provisioned as a part of, you know, this entire setup. So I think that's where, you know, this whole thing comes into the picture. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a lot of, you know, I, I, I think that using GetOps actually is fairly 
I hate to say it, it's actually kind of complicated because uh, because it, it, it requires a lot of ex, it requires a lot of expertise on the author, right? And so I, I give this whole spiel, you know, this is not subject to this presentation about engineering burden or de developer burden is like just increasing all the time in the name of shifting left. Like, you know, I, 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 I'm not an expert in networking. I'm not. My, actually, my biggest outage was a VPC misconfiguration and any networking engineer would have caught that and I had to go fly and apologize to our client that I blocked half the internet with a cider rule. Another story for another time. But, uh, you know, it's like, it, it's really instilling some of that expertise, like as a developer where some Mark would have caught it, right? And so, yeah, truth, you know, maybe if they look over it, like, oh, you know, we see that configuration is a little bit off, but it, it's really pushing, you know, expertise around. And it requires, uh, I would say, a semi-sophisticated team uh, or a popular engineering model uh, to, to run that. So, but do try it, right? Like, hey, don't let that be a hurdle. It's just, it, it's a little bit of, you know, it's self-service to the extreme. Like, you know, <laughs> as many times a day I commit into our SEM solution, expect a change. <laughs> Uh, to be rolling out uh, as quickly. So. And, and also just to add to what Ravi is saying, right? Uh, the bigger thing with Git is that you have the whole capability of doing drift detection, right? One of the biggest advantages. So you know what exactly has changed, right? So when say, now Ravi made a change on the VPC side, something did not work. We know what that change is going to look like. So Git helps with that. So, you know, when you, when you start going in that direction, it helps you uh, see that Git becomes your source of truth and what exactly has changed. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, let's see, we have Kate's, I think this is more of a uh, statement. Um, uh, let's see, um, there's two questions. Uh, it, one would be, uh, which GitOps tool is best to use? That's, I, we'll say that for a little, a little bit later. Um, and then, uh, let's see, uh, two questions. It's, it's a similar question to the multi-verse mono repo. Multi-repo is owned by ops team or multi-repos owned by devs, which are app repos. Um, so I guess the, that, that question might be who, who's the custodian or who's the owner of the repositories? Um, I, I would say either or, <laughs> right? Like uh, usually it just goes back to who runs your SCM, right? So like, is it a dev tools team? Is it an engineering efficiency team? Is it a central tools team? Uh, is it, yourself, <laughs> you know, use GitHub, <laughs> you just click, 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 you know, like, so um, it, it, I, I feel like, like any piece of developer tooling, you know, it's, uh, there's operational aspects to it. There's, you know, quote, unquote, there's DevOps aspects to it. How do you in increase the efficiency of the pipeline? How do you secure it? How do you make it more robust? Um, I, I would say it's, uh, you know, it, it's one or, or is not the requirement uh, for GitOps. Uh, let's see here. So uh, other, other questions that is, uh, how, how does GitOps, GitOps tools handle securing the infrastructure which is deployed as part of GitOps? So Marth, I know you have a, I can juicy, take this one. <laughs> a juicy one for this one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is, uh, you have different ways that you could handle this. And then the, basically what you could do is you could have a specific pre-deployment step where what you decide is you provision infrastructure. So you could use tools like Terraform, you know, you have different tools like CloudFormation. They are responsible for uh, getting the infrastructure provision before your actual deployment happens. And, you know, obviously there's harness to, you know, help tie all these together. So what really happens in this case is you have your pre-deployment step, which is nothing but you making a change in the uh, Terraform source repository. And there's a TF file, a Terraform file, which harness pulls in and it provisions that infrastructure for you. And what happens after that is that, you know, the GitOps tool that you're using will do the deployment on top of this. So when it comes to basically provisioning your infrastructure before, uh, you know what infrastructure needs to be provisioned for this deployment. You, you know the artifact that you're deploying, you know what percentage of EC2 instance is required, what percentage of VMs are required. You know, you provision just that much, then you deploy your artifact using your GitOps tool. And right after that, you can decide to either keep your infrastructure hanging for some time to make sure everything looks good, or you can tear it down. So the way I see it personally would be, you have your Terraform set up, or you, know, you have a TF state file, which is doing the provisioning of your entire thing. You have a TF apply, then you have you know, your queue cuttle apply, and then you basically have a TF destroy. So that would be the entire order with GitOps. Cool, yeah, and just like, you know, 
it also it's it goes back to expertise dissemination right yeah. so this, i was thinking yeah, this like the last question too uh, which it, this is actually you know instead of my outage it might be a security hardening right which is even it's, it's more realistic right like sure. um it, it's how do you you know how how the GitOps tool by itself will not enable security it, it's it's like any other tool right like in and by itself you're not automatically pci compliant by using GitOps. ops like overstated answer there uh, but it's just about how you disseminate the information, right? Like how, you know, providing an archetype or a template uh, for Robbie, who doesn't secure his app, like I do, but who is not good at sanitizing his inputs per our AppSec team. Um, you know, you, you're trying to disseminate the information across the pipeline. And so I might understand it a little bit better because it's codified, right? I'm like, oh yeah, like instead of making these like WAF rules or, you know, NIST rules on the Linux machine and disabling passwords and, SSH, like, I don't know what that means, uh, but I do know what certain, you know, if I could see it codified for me in like in a Kubernetes manifest, like, oh, you know, this is, this is what, this is what they mean, right? So uh, it's a tool by itself. It's just how do you disseminate the, that information across uh, the SLC? Um, so I think uh, two, two questions kind of go together. One question was which GitOps tool is best to use? Uh, and then also uh, one question was, uh, what are the differences between Argo, Flux, and Jenkins X? So uh, I can take a stab at that, or Samarth, do you want to take the, uh, what are the core differences between those tools? I could I could take a stab at it, and then Ravi, maybe you can add more. Um, from the differences standpoint between Argo, Flux, and Jenkins X, at least from an Argo and Flux perspective, uh, pretty much they are, you know, operators. So the way I see it is that Argo is, has, you know, an operator for doing GitOps, Flux has an operator for doing GitOps. Uh, with Jenkins X, it's more like how they tie all of these things together. Uh, when it comes to Argo, pretty much, you know, Argo is only doing Kubernetes, same thing with Flux. With Jenkins X, it's more like tying in the operator, but it's coming in a little bit early on in the cycle. So it's more like CI and CD, but with Argo and Flux, it's more towards the CD side. All they care about is, you know, they don't really want to worry about how your build process happens or, you know, what happens as a part of your artifact development. It's more about, oh, once the artifact's ready, how do I do the apply for it? So, you know, that's where the operators come into the picture. That's where the drift detection comes into the picture. How do we make it converge with your deployment pipeline? That's what Argo and Flux does. With Jenkins X on the other side, what they do is it's responsible for doing CI and CD, but it's also responsible for making sure that, you know, we start shifting left because they want to start getting the whole GitOps module added right in the beginning of the phase itself, which is on the CI side. So that is shifting left to reduce failure. That's how I would see it. Yeah, I mean that that's that's better of an answer, better than I would have said it. Uh, <laughs> like Ar Ar Argo is more of a a tool, and then Flux is an engine, right? So actually, those two projects were you know, had a lot of connective tissue, and then they fell out. I'm not sure what, how like they they were going to be using like some like connective bits with each other, um, but but again, like th there's a lot of tooling, you know, like that kind of spun up around this because it's like it's becoming more and more as as Kubernetes is becoming more popular. Uh, this paradigm or operator-based model uh, is becoming more popular too. And so there's like several GitOps tools um, out there now. The most pop prevalent is Argo. Uh, I used to think Argo was that tea they sold at Starbucks. Then I was told it was a GitOps engine. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that, oh, the Raspberry tea? No, no, I'm joking. But um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I see a lot of Argo um, out there. So Hey, beauty's in the beauty's in the eye of the beholder. You know, no one tool will solve all hundreds of the problems. You know, we we clearly work at harness, and so we might say harness <laughs> to that answer. But yeah, you know, hey, definitely look into it. If you haven't looked into it before, there's lots of great tools out there and material out there to get you started. And you know, I'm re I'm really excited about GitOps. Um, so I hope that answered your question out there. Let's see. How is Argo Flux better than baking CD into pipelines, assuming proper Kubernetes permissions through RBAC? I'm not sure what that question means. Uh, Maybe I can help, Ravi. Yeah, yeah. I, think, uh, I can help out with this one. So I think, uh, so assuming proper Kubernetes permissions through RBAC. So I do want to call out that, you know, when Argo and Flux, uh, the they're responsible specifically for taking your YAML file and deploying it. So your kubectl apply basically is taking the manifest, it renders the manifest and it does the apply on the cluster. And that's how you know Argo and Flux come into the picture. When it comes to assuming proper Kubernetes permissions through RBAC, uh, you're pretty much talking about the cluster level permissions, right? But what if you wanted that Ravi and I, if we happen to work in the same department, 
you want to make sure that Ravi does not have access to the production deployments, but I do, or, you know, Ravi is not supposed to be approving tickets, but I do. In that case, you know, you have the approval steps that come in the middle. It's the different sets of approvals that you want to do. Maybe you want to have a Jira integration. Maybe you want to have a service now integration, if that's your tool of choice. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that all of this is recorded uh, as different things happen. In this case, if your cluster goes down, so does your pipeline. So that's the important thing to also consider, right? Uh, in the case of Harness, what happens is that when the cluster goes down, we tell you we do not have connectivity and it's going to make a retry to the cluster. Once the cluster is back up, it's going to make sure it picks it back up from the same point. But in the case of Argo, because Argo or Flux is installed on your Kubernetes cluster, should the cluster go down, everything goes down with it. Yeah, I, yeah, like what, what awesome, awesome explanation. Hope that answered uh, the, if you're still listening after um, that answered your question. Uh, what, one thing, this is an observation uh, that I had about the tooling as a long time abuser of systems. Um, typically GitOps systems are very optimistic. And so what that means is that they, they actually assume it will pass, right? It assumes the deployment's gonna you know, be promoted or the change should go out. Um, should go out flawlessly. It does allow for quicker iteration. So if something didn't happen, um, you, know, you can like kind of kind of reapply the, la the last known state. But it is they are optimistic in their past. Uh, we take a little like ten, like two seconds about us. So we take a little bit different path. So Mark might shake his head at me if I say this. Like probably will. Uh, you know, we, we take a more pessimistic model. You know, we're we're building in failure from the get go. We're assuming that you know we're providing all the safety that. Uh, you know, this particular deployment might not work. And so we'll provide you very easy ways to back it up. But, you know, not too much of a harness pitch here. It's more for education. Um, it looks like uh, there's no more questions. Um, and hey, if there's any, any last minute questions, feel free to get them in. Uh, if not, thank everybody so much for attending the webinar or seeing us after the fact. It really means a lot to Samarth and I uh, uh, today. Great. Thank you so much to Ravi and Samar for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you.